You may be seated. Today we have heard the continuation of the story both in 2 Samuel and in the Gospel of John. In 2 Samuel, uh, we've heard the second part of the story of David and Bathsheba. Last week, we heard the story of David uh, coveting Bathsheba, committing adultery, and having Uriah uh, killed in battle. And this week, the prophet Nathan has come to uh, help David to understand the depth of his sin. Um, And isn't it ironic that Nathan begins with a story that makes David indignant, right? Uh, He tells a story of a witch man who has all of these uh, lambs and sheep and uh, how when he has a guest come over, rather than slaughtering one of his own sheep for the feast, he goes and he takes the one lamb that his poor neighbor has. And David has said, oh, who would do such a thing? You know, what an awful, awful thing to do. Uh, And then Nathan, of course, says, you are that man. Um, You are the one uh, who took Bathsheba. And this is why David remains a hero of the faith. As soon as he sees and understands the depth of his sin, it's pointed out to him by another person. How hard is that to hear, right? Then he immediately asks God for forgiveness. We haven't yet heard the story of the birth of his son um, who is born sick and David who makes uh, lamentation and um, beseeches God in prayer and fasting and ashes on his head, begging for this child's life. Ultimately, the child does die. Um, and, And in this story, we see both the depth of David's sin and his spiritual wisdom in throwing himself at God's feet, pleading for mercy. How much self-awareness, how much spiritual courage does it take to be able to hear the prophet Nathan and to be able to see what it is that he has done? And how much trust does he have in the grace of God to know that even in this case, he can throw himself at God's feet and ask for forgiveness and know that he will be forgiven, that there is no such thing as an unforgivable sin. It's an amazing story. We hear from the Apostle Paul, one of my very favorite passages of Scripture. In fact, if I had to choose a chapter of Scripture uh, to be my favorite, this would definitely be in the top five, where Paul begs us to lead a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. Later in this chapter, Paul writes about spiritual gifts and the ways that we are all gifted For ministry, we are all gifted to serve the Lord. And that the purpose of the church and the leaders of the church is to equip the saints for the works of ministry. And it reminds me of one of my favorite, you know, Christian pithy sayings that you sometimes see on church signs and hear in sermons like this one. God does not call the qualified. God qualifies the called. Which reminds us that it's not about whatever it is that we can do. It's about being faithful in responding to God's call and knowing and trusting that God is able to work in and through us to accomplish anything that God calls us to do. And believe me, serving in the way that I do within the church, I rely on that truth a lot. Because if you had told me that I was going to be a pastor, I would have called you crazy before I was actually called to be a pastor. Um, And I continue, as we all do, to rely on the grace of God to equip, to rely on the grace of God who calls. That is, at its heart, what sanctifying grace is. It's the grace that makes us more holy It's the grace that equips us. It's the grace that makes us more and more like Jesus. 
And we are promised, David understood this, we are promised that as we continue in relationship with God, as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, even though we sin and fail and screw up and miss the mark, God continues both to forgive and to work in us to equip and to enable us to live the life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. And then we hear the story from the Gospel of John. It's the story that immediately follows the feeding of the 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fish. It is the story of Jesus' I am statement in which Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And so I want to ask you one of my real live questions. I haven't done that in a little while. And uh, the parameters are this. If you feel led to say something, please speak out. Uh, if you prefer to be in silence, please feel comfortable being silent. And the question, I think, is a really simple one. What do you think of when you hear the word bread? What immediately comes to your mind when you think of bread? to read the newspaper, you know. I was beginning to imitate my family, and we got the Washington Post on our doorstep every morning, and I would wake up, and the um, first thing my parents would do is sit at the table and read the newspaper, so I would do the same thing. Of course, mine was the comics. Uh, and then as I got a little bit older, it was the comics and Ann Landers. Um, Ann Landers and Dear Abby were the twin sisters who both did advice columns for years and years, and Ann Landers was in the Washington Post. And in fact, when I went to college and for years after that, my father would clip and save 
every Ann Landers column for me and send it to me. Of course, now I wish I'd saved them. I had the shoeboxes full of Ann Landers columns, you know. And, <clears throat> and I remember a thread of letters going back and forth in which people were debating whether or not it was worth the time and effort to sit in church and hear sermons, most of which we forget after a short period of time, right? And so people will go back and forth and you know, talk about whether this was useful or not. And it was definitively the last letter that kind of settled the question, uh, or at least she stopped printing letters about it after this one, was uh, a man who wrote in and he said, my dear wife has cooked dinner for me almost every night for the last 30 years. I can hardly remember one of those meals, but every one of them nourished me. And so it is with the bread of life. I wish that every time I came to church, I wish that every time I went to prayer, I had some spectacularly memorable experience of the grace of God. Oh, how I wish. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And when we partake of Jesus, he satisfies a spiritual hunger and thirst within us. It may not be a market on the calendar moment, it may be just Tuesday night dinner, but it still nourishes us. It still blesses and strengthens us, and we need to come to the table to receive the bread of life over and over and over again. That's the nature of what it is to be in relationship with Jesus. This summer has also a time when I have been spending a lot of time doing self-reflection, doing my own spiritual inventories, uh, doing a lot of journaling, and trying to be a bit more like David in being able to see where it is that I need to grow, being able to see where it is that I need to ask for forgiveness. And the first thing I've been reminded of is something that we all know. I am much better at seeing things in you all than I am in me. <laughs> you know, for the people in my life I'm close to, I could go down a list. You know, here are the things that you need to work on. Uh, but that's not really the important question. The important question is, okay, Jesus, what do I need to work on? How do I need to grow? Where do I need to seek forgiveness? And what I have found is both that God has brought me a long ways over these last 20 plus years as I have fed on the bread of life and that I still have a long way to go. And most notably that even some things that I thought I had kind of worked through or learned how to handle better. Okay, I've learned to handle them better, but they're not done yet. <laughs> I still struggle with feeling too responsible for a church that belongs to God, not me. I still struggle with surrendering to God. I still struggle with fear, fear of failure, Fear of not being a successful pastor, whatever that definition is. Fear of not being a good wife or a good mom. All of those things are still there. And I need the bread of life to continue to nourish me and strengthen me and teach me because God has brought me a long way, but there's still a ways to go yet. This is the nature of grace. This is the nature of faith, is that we come and we come and we come again every week, every day, as people who trust and want to trust in the grace of God, people who want to be made well, people who want to be healed, knowing that just as day by day food at our table nourishes us. So day by day, the bread of life nourishes us and strengthens us and leads us along the way 
that we may indeed be worthy of to lead a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. We do this not in our own strength, but in the strength of the one who feeds us, who nourishes us, who carries us, who loves us completely, and who invites us this day again to the feast of God's grace. May it indeed nourish and strengthen us anew. Amen.